I make see you again. Uh. Speak louder than words. That is the answer. My good people, how not they? Beautiful people, tell me what in day. Love is the answer. May we show love to one another. That's so we go grow together. Nothing could put us asunder. Asunder, love is the answer. May we show love to one another. That's so we go grow together. Put us asunder, asunder, that is the shower. When we show love to one another, that's how we go grow together. Nothing go put us asunder, asunder, love is the answer. Love is the answer, man. Every day, yes, so. Hi, and welcome to the Shepherd and Culture Kitchen's Watch Party. My name is Megan McBain from Goulburn Valley Health. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we live, work and play. We pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which we live. We remember the lives lost, children stolen and land taken. We recognise the past and continuing dispossession of the First Peoples. We pay our respects to the land and collaboratively move forward in unity. The Shepparton Culture Kitchens is an exciting project supported by Multicultural Arts Victoria and Greater Shepparton City Council to explore the diverse food cultures of Shepparton's many communities and the vital role they play in addressing significant issues of health inequity and disadvantage facing the region. A creative team has been established comprising women from culturally diverse Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander backgrounds who are creative thinkers, good communicators, well connected to their community and who are passionate and knowledgeable about traditional food cultures. The creative team is led by Singaporean Eurasian artist Jamie Lewis and has designed a range of unique interactive food sourcing, cooking and eating experiences and public events for the whole community. Community storytelling and non-Western knowledge are at the heart of this project that offers diverse communities the opportunity to respond to issues of health inequity, to reconnect with their mother cultures and build and diversify local knowledge around food cultures and healthy eating. Today, you're in for a real treat. 
You'll be hearing from participants of the Shepherd and Culture Kitchens project and learn about the relationships they have with food and their culture here in Shepparton. Shepherd and Culture Kitchens has put forward a creative way of looking at healthy eating in the diverse community that makes up our area. It has shown us that healthy eating isn't just about the food that we eat, but the culture and stories surrounding food, as well as the people that we cook, eat and gather with. It has highlighted the importance of including these aspects in our work when we talk about health and well-being. It is the hope that the Shepherd and Culture Kitchens program will continue to engage women from a diverse backgrounds to come together and share their knowledge and cultures with each other and the wider local community through food, storytelling and the arts. I'd now like to introduce your host for today, Melissa Salunga, Community Engagement Facilitator for Shepherd and Culture Kitchen, Samoan Cultural Leader, Director of Know Your Roots and Pacifica Festival and co-founder of Point of Difference Studio. Thanks. Shepherd and Culture Kitchen has been about empowering women in our diverse communities who keep the knowledge of their traditional food cultures to become storytellers and leaders and who can carry on the legacy of this work. Throughout the project, they have collaborated and participated in a creative process that has opened their eyes to new possibilities. It has provided them with new skills and confidence to advocate and develop and deliver new programs that address issues of health inequity, affecting their communities through self-determined approaches and with the support of partners across local government, health, arts and community sectors. The project is about placing community in the driver's seat, about community self-determined approaches to health promotion and the importance of empowering women from communities to be part of the solution to issues facing their communities. Too often women from diverse communities see themselves as only having subservient roles to play in their family and the community, but given the right supports and platforms, women can be powerful catalysts for change and the ones who can lead their communities towards a more equitable, sustainable and healthy future. Shakila Navid arrived in Australia in 2017 after a difficult journey to escape the dangers of war in Afghanistan, where some of her family remain today. She has found a peaceful, happy home in multicultural Shepparton, where there is a large Afghan community and many opportunities for women that had never been available to her before. Cooking has been a central part of Shakila's life since she was a young girl, learning to make bread with her mother, after getting married in Pakistan, Shakila then completed a cooking course with a professional chef. She is a skilled cook with an interest in a wide variety of cuisine. Her favorite meals to cook include dumplings, biryani, various kinds of kebabs and sauces. She loves to cook traditional meals and appreciates how it keeps her connected to family, culture and childhood. For Shakila, healthy eating means involving everyone in the process of preparing, cooking and serving the food. It means working together, sitting together and eating together. Food is what brings her community together, allowing people to gather and share conversation and joy through eating. Shakila. When I was in Pakistan, just housewife. The whole day I was cleaning and cooking and making food and look after the the children and the family, nothing else. In Pakistan, because the women, they cannot go out, there is no job for women. When I came in Australia, I had the opportunity, I can do, and that's what I want to do. I work three days full time and studying as well. And a mother often four children and a housewife, I try to work very hard and do all. <laughs> Still, I miss my family, my sisters, my my mother. They are in Afghanistan. Sometimes I call them, especially during you know the Taliban now, so they cannot go out. Sometimes when I call them, when I talk about them, so I get a little bit emotional. So my my mother, she is unwell. Even she cannot go to the doctor. Most of the time when we eat, we remember you know the nan buta, and we remember you know from the childhood how, you know, the, my mom, she was making, and and we were very excited to eat. And I started learning from that, and they were focusing on the bread. 
<laughs> so who can make the perfect bread? So everyone loved that girl. Uh, she can do everything. Because we love to, you know, to keep our culture. Uh, that's why we have a lot of gathering, cooking together and making, you know, the traditional food. The whole day we preparing food because many people, it's not easy to prepare everything, you know. We, we enjoy, we talking about, you know, mostly we talk about in our country. We cook every day. I think it is not like we don't need much time. So the whole family when we in been involved in we cooking and eating together and they know what is their responsibility, what they can do, how they can cook. She never let me out of kitchen. When we gathering we cook a big big pot, different different kind of food. The whole family they know the youngest son when I say, Okay, you have to do job today, clean this area. He knows have to clean all the this area and then do this one and the men just make barbecue and the woman cooking. We cannot make it home. We do it in, in our garage. We make a curry, mostly we make curry with kofta and then rice and then salad and then different sauce. This is the kebab. Actually, this is the new kebab I learned yesterday. <laughs> in Pakistan, they have a big just kitchen, you know, separate kitchen. But here we don't have, we have to be very careful. If it's, you know, we live in rental house, we cannot cook, you know, even in the garage as well. And, you know, the, the cups or maybe stuff, the plates, one, we don't have, you know, less, we have uh, maybe a hundred plates. When I told my husband to make a kitchen, separate kitchen, but he didn't, <laughs> he didn't do it, he said, no, no, it is not possible. That's why we stay connected with the food traditional food making and if it's not food I think we I if I invite some people no one can. Afghan community they are very big in Shepardan but no one know about the food much. The hardest thing is we cannot find any Afghan food in Shepardan. If anyone wants to eat Afghan food and then they have to go milk. It is not easy. We love to eat together. Without you know the family, you know, we don't enjoy eating. That's why we have to sit together and eat together. It's been a pleasure working with these women in Ship Culture Kitchen. Um, but as we went through the project, uh, it was clear that we face a lot of issues in our diverse communities, even while living here in Shepparton. And some of those issues are around how we maintain eating healthy um, in, in a place or in a country where the, the foods that we are used to eating in our own countries are not always made available to us or are hard to grow in our own backyards because for the majority of the women that participate in Ship Culture Kitchen, all of them have grown vegetables, um, grown, uh, raised their own cattle or, or meat um, and been able to take that from the paddock and put it on their plates. Now living in multicultural Shepparton, um, access to foods that they're familiar with um, has proven difficult. In, as part of this, um, it also causes them to pick up um, unhealthy habits um, that they're not used to and because they're limited to what they have, uh, they, they make do with, with, with the food options that they um, continue to have. So in saying that, not being able to access culturally appropriate foods or fresh products has been a number one. But coupling this is also uh, a change in diet also comes around identity or belonging or being able to fit in. So, you know, straying from a diet that you're used to because others are looking at you and watching what you're eating, unfamiliar with the things that they see or smell, 
can um, cause uh, some of us to uh, do away with eating the traditional foods that our, our bodies are used to and integrating into eating the new diet of the new country we live in. Not being able to be seen as different contributes to this or the fear of judgment or even others being racist towards us because of the food we choose to eat that we are used to. And of course, the aggressive junk food advertising that is always on the TV. So why not have a hamburger instead of that healthy meal that you're used to from Samoa or Africa? The lure of fast foods is real and the addiction to sugar is real. Um, and once you've had a taste of it, it's hard to go back. These are just some of the many uh, issues that our diverse communities face in our community in terms of trying to, to eat a healthy diet. Um, whereas prior to arriving in, in the country we currently live in Australia or in, in our hometown of Shepparton, access to fresh products and culturally appropriate foods were, were um, available. Now it's only when it's made available in the stores and we're grateful for those stores who carry them locally. Um, but yet those are still uh, the very live issues that impact the lives of many of our diverse communities here when it comes to food and healthy eating. Agnes Kaul is originally from South Sudan. She made Shepparton home in 2001 with her husband and is bringing up her six children as part of the community that she loves and is proud of. Agnes learned how to cook with her mother, making traditional recipes that have been passed down through generations in her family. Her cooking style has continued to evolve since living in Australia with foods and recipes from all over the world, a mix of different cultures and traditions. The most important thing to her though, is that food is created with love and shared with others. The first time I ate food in Australia, we went pizza shop. And I'm pointing to the one we want, and then they cook it, we take it home, we try to eat it, it tastes different. I say, which kind of food of this? Maybe it's uh, pig, we don't know, chicken, we don't know. And then I remember they give us like uh, Hawaiian, the one with pineapple. I say, why meat with the fruit? This food, I don't like it. <laughs> I buy that one bite, I say no. I don't want to eat it. It's better to sleep without eating. And then tomorrow we, I will go shop and buy something to cook, but something already been cooked. I don't know which flavor they put in, which kind of vegetable. When I was eight years old, I start to cook. I start to make fire because I'm the first child. I need to help. The time my mother is cooking, I need to sit next to my mother and ask a lot of questions. How do you cook this? and show me how to cook it. We live in North Sudan, and then when South Sudan came independent in 2011, my parents decided to go to South. I said to myself to visit in South Sudan, because we never see South Sudan. It's a long journey. We hug each other, we cry, we talk, we talk. And then after two years, my father passed away. But I thank God because I went to see him before he passed away. He said, my daughter, thank you for bringing your kiss. And my God bless you and bless your family. Maybe we're going to meet one time, one day. That word is stuck in my heart and in my mind. Because to leave the country, to go other country, to live in it without your parents, or your grandparent never came to that country. It's not easy at all. But for us, we're chasing for a better life because back home we have war. The surprise thing when we're eating lunch, in Australia, everyone has their own plate. But back home, we have only one senior. The soup, when they cook it, we put it in one, pl one plate. And we eat with our hand, no fork, no knife or spoon. My son, he washes his hand. He see the kids, how they grab the food to eat. 
He don't know how to grab the food to eat. And he's washing around and around. And he turned, the food is finished. <laughs> and he say, what is that? I can't even grab one bite to eat. My mother say, oh, you need to learn. This is our traditional. We can't say we can make you your own food. Nobody is special. Everyone, we need to eat together. Like me, I like to cook and then we sit together and eat. It gives me joy. I feel I'm happy. I'm feeding my family. And I know who eat and who doesn't eat. You can talk. You can share what's happening that today. We eat together every day. For us, we don't have frozen vegetables. Always fresh. Always. But when we come here, we find everything is frozen. Even bananas frozen. We say, oh, it's different culture. <laughs> but we try to do it, to live in two sets society. Like uh, our culture, Australian culture, balance them together. During Corona time, food safety, they bought a lot of canned food. We keep it here, we never try to open. <laughs> and then I said to one lady, how are you going to use this canned food? She, she said to me, it's, it's normal food being cooked and put them on the can. And then I said, how long? She said, maybe one, two years. I said, one and two years, not for me. <laughs> Between the organic and the one have chemical, then you can know it. You can smell it. You can know it, that one organic or it's not organic. Food can connect us with the different culture, uniting us together. When you learn other culture or other people, and we can share together. Yeah. Food, food bring us together. <laughs> On visiting Shepherd and One Easter, Leisa was drawn to the calming presence of Victoria Lake and soon settled in the area. The water in the man-made lake reminded Leisa of her childhood home in the island of Samoa, where she lived right on the edges of the ocean with her family. It is where she learned to fish with her parents, eating seafood direct from the sea as well as fruit and leaves from the trees around them. Family occasions provided Laesa with the opportunity to observe how to prepare traditional Samoan food for big feasts. The practice of using existing ingredients around her continues to influence Laesa in her cooking today. She enjoys improvising with traditional ingredients, combining them with what she can find in her kitchen to create her own version of traditional dishes. In this way, she hopes her children can appreciate the flavors from her own children that she so fondly remembers. Despite the many challenges of assessing the ingredients and resources she requires to prepare traditional salmon foods, for Leisa, food is not only a way to feed and nourish those you love, but also to connect with, learn from, and care for each other. It is a vital part of healthy, happy life. She hopes her children will carry her traditional salmon culture and values with them and give them a strong sense of belonging. The fishermen just arrived and they throw you a fish. Oh my gosh. The only thing you gotta look for is a sharp knife. And all you gotta do is cut the fins out so you don't cut yourself and cut you know your mouth when you eat it. You cut the head, cut the tail, because all the things that you cannot chew with your teeth. Drop it up and you put it in a bowl of water or salty water. You add a bit of lemon or lime. Mm, can't get any better than that. Coming from the island in Samoa, we're surrounded by sea. Oh, I love water. Mm. So our, our house is right on, you know, right on the sea kind of thing. So coming here to Shepparton, I just stand there on that, you know, the edges of the lake. Just took me back home. We're blessed enough to have one fish. <laughs> shop in Shepparton and uh, the poor man there that owns it he tries to keep it fresh so he does he has two days of deliveries Tuesday and Thursday 
So during Saturday, he'll find all the islanders in there, <laughs> trying to take all the all the fish for this for this purpose to eat it raw. The fish that's available here, it, it's not the same as the ones we have back in the islands. Over here, you gotta pay for it, you know. Whereas back in the islands, nah. You don't pay for it because it's straight from the sea. Whoever goes fishing, yeah, you share and share. Um, they have colorful fish. But over here, you don't get much color than the black and, you know, the red snapper, yeah, and the salmon. But back in the islands, you get all sorts of colorful fish. So we do all sorts of things. And, you know, I learned how to go fishing both with my dad in a canoe. And also with my mom just walking around there getting pippies and, you know, the seashells and all those sort of things. So they will go home and they'll cook it and I'll eat the fish or they'll feed me the fish and they'll drink the, um, the soup. But thinking and looking back at it now, you know, they, they, they gave me the best of what they had. Back in Samoa, the men cook. They go out fishing and as soon as they come out, doesn't matter what time of the night, late night, early hours of, or during the day, as soon as they come, that's it. The women will be sitting there waiting, <laughs> waiting to eat. <laughs> Not waiting to cook, waiting to eat because the men come out. Yeah, and then they also have to, you know, wash and dry up and cook <laughs> while we wait. Because it's so easy, just cut it, you know, get all the guts out, get your bottle of salt, you know, and your bowl of water. <laughs> You know, Bob's your uncle, while it's fresh. It's very rare to see it nowadays if, you know, we were to go back to Samoa. It's only back in the, um, the villages out back. Fast food in Samoa is seen as a treat. It's only those who are in town, who live in town, or who work in town, they can afford the fast food. I'm a mother of teenage boys, my goodness. It's so, it's so different from my life as a teenager when fast food never existed. I think, you know, sicknesses and illnesses is because of all the processed food. Back then, you know, in the, the 70s, 80s, 60s, there was no diabetes, there was no cancer, there was no, no they, they never existed. Our ancestors and our parents only died from old age, you know, because there was no such thing as processed food, fast food was a fruit or, you know, something off the ground or something off the trees or something from the sea, you know, where we eat seashells, you know. These issues of departure from tradition, healthy diets, and not replacing them with a healthy alternative are very real issues for many of our diverse peoples. Shepherd and Culture Kitchen has responded to this in a different way though, not by telling people that they need to eat better, but through providing opportunities to reconnect with traditional food, cultures, and sharing these with each other and with the broader community to build pride and confidence. Joining us on the screen now is Le Aisa Pele, um, who has been part of the Shep Culture Kitchen project since the beginning. Le Aisa, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Talofa. Is that, how, is that how you say hello in Samoan? Yes, Talofa Lava Melissa Silanga. Talofa Le Aisa. Uh, today we'd like to ask a, a, a couple of questions. I think I've only got one massive question for you. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you'll, you'll have fun answering it for us today. I will do my best. Through this project, you got to be the first person in Shepparton's history to do the Samoan Umu in public. Can you tell us about this experience and how this made you and your family feel? And do you think having more opportunities to do this could promote healthier eating in our communities? 
Wow. Well, firstly, um, it was a very, very humbling experience for my family and I, I must admit, being the first Samoan family ever to be given the opportunity to do a yomo in public. Um, there are no words to express our gratitude towards the, the people behind it, um, especially the council and uh, the MAV. Um, the list goes on, especially to Anita and uh, Jamie Lee for all the, the hard work as well as Melissa Silanga for, you know, pushing and promoting. Anyway, the experience itself, I think um, if there are slots of the or video shots of the Umu, you will see how very um, uh, inclusive it was and how uh, entertaining as well as um, it was a learning experience for both uh, my family as well as the uh, the audience because it was also the first time my, my children uh, got to do it firsthand. They've experienced it on our trip overseas to Samoa, but never, never been exposed and actually do it hands on with their father. And what a way to do it was with their father. So uh, all in all, it was a, um, it was a very, very learned and uh, enjoyable experience because not only we uh, we got to um, showcase how uh, the Samoan food is traditionally cooked in the umu and how the umu was made from the beginning to the end and everybody got to um, participate and watch and learn how, you know, we do what we do best in cooking our food, um, that we don't need anything fancy. We don't need the um, electrical, um, you know, the switch on and off buttons, but it was the actual fire rocks and the food being cooked on the, on rocks and um, the taste of it is extremely different from having cooked, you know, on um, conventional oven. So um, as well as sharing the um, part of who we are, you know, through our cooking of our food and through our food, um, I think to say the least, it was a very um, huge and unique and the biggest blessing that it could have come in a better way, it couldn't have come in a better way than it did for us all. Uh, our only hope, or my hope, um, that in the future, that you know, the opportunities like opportunities like this will be given, you know, to share. Because the more we share, the more we enjoy, and the more we connect with our people, uh, not just within our own community, but with community with other communities at large. Yeah, so it was a very, very unique experience and a humbling experience, to say the least. Uh, I love how you touched on um, the hope that these opportunities will happen again because it connects people. Um, and we found through Shep Culture Kitchen that that was probably one of the most highlighted parts of this project was that uh, eight different women from different cultures were able to connect through food. Yeah. Um, and, and find a sense of belonging, even in uh, amongst a small small group. Yeah. Um, and moving forward, like you said in the video that you know everyone has now viewed of the umu, um, and people do come together yeah. over over. I mean, it seems like a small thing to us yeah. um, because we are Samoan, but to in yeah. the overall or the bigger picture is being able to see greater community enjoy and be part of the process of, yeah. you know, beginning to end or, yeah. you know, beginning of what is to, about to be plated up to what you actually get to enjoy and taste. So yeah. thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, thank you for having, you know, to share and expose and given the opportunities for us to open up our doors and to allow and enable our people to come together you know, in sharing because, you know, food, cooking food and sharing food is not just about eating, but it's also about connecting and getting getting the community love and aroha pass around. Yes. Thank you, Asa. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing more umors being created and shared amongst our communities and future festivals. And we look forward to seeing what else great things you'll be able to provide our community as well. 
Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. No Thank worries. You. Thank, Thank you. you. For many of our communities, it comes down to finding ways that we can balance our traditional food cultures with the Australian way. And this isn't just about what we eat, but how we eat. We are seeing a common thread here that food is an important means to keeping people living in despair, connected to their traditional ways of life, their cultures and values, their families and memories. We used to live in countryside, lots of orchard state palm trees around, lots of uh, vegetables, but because of war, they deliberately destroy uh, lots of area of uh, the trees. So many trees died there. It was really nice, green, <laughs> but now no, not anymore. My little granddaughter, she's watered the <laughs> veggies every. Yeah, she loved her things and she got, you know, the little shuffle and she's always covering us. She covered her mom when she's in the garden, watering the garden. Some basil and tomato, capsicum and zucchini and mint, um, celery as well, beetroot. Some cucumber as well and silver beets. Uh, lots of spices. The Iraqi parsley and as well the celery. Two things I need whenever I go. It's different flavor, different taste of the one in the shop. We were surprised when we saw the big, big <laughs> celery. We used to have a small, tasty, nice one. In. Yeah, because that one, when I eat it from the shop, is, I got this sort of allergy to the food. I don't know if it's because of chemicals or because of flavor. So I'm never, uh, you know, bought it from the shop. The herbs uh, and the veggies, you know, the taste from my own country. So wherever I go, we got very nice garden with all the kind of veggies. We were lucky we had this house. The soil was so good there. One time I remember we collect like um, uh, that much uh, eggplant and as well uh, watermelon, uh, parsley, different kind of chilies, or uh, all these <laughs> kind of veggies. So you know, fresh, and we were so happy to give it to the friends. When you taste the vegetable from your garden, your own garden, you kind of different taste between the one you buy from the shop and the one you use it from your own garden taste. It's really <laughs> nice. Mm. So nice. <laughs> when I first came, I thought, oh, our food is our food. We eat it uh, everywhere. And they said, oh, they, they are embarrassed or to take, you know, the traditional food. They take just a plain toast with some kind of cheese. So from that, and um, they probably they heard from their Australian friend, oh, this is yucky or this is not nice food. Yeah. My kids, they don't want to have the Lebanese bread. Uh, they said, no, Mama, we don't want to take this one and this one. Uh, so we need to um, raise the awareness because a healthy food is, is good to promote for these kids, as well as culture need to be respected everywhere. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's try the other one. <laughs> With the date palm tree, this is a very special, unique tree for, uh, for Arabic culture. The tree is uh, survived from all the date until now. And in Quran, there is a phrase that mentions uh, how it's the trees uh, worship gods. Because we believe everything is in universal worshiping God. And even the trees. So the trees got this, the life and the trees that what the trees giving us, giving us the fruit, giving us, it's all from trees. One of my friends, she was working with me. She's uh, one of them, she's an Australian and the other one, she's from yeah. Fiji. And they mentioned how we got this relationship with the, 
the trees and we talked to the trees. I, I told them, I got uh, this tree and it's not getting the fruit. And they said, go to the, your tree, water the tree and talk to them. So I went to my tree, I talked to her, I put some water every day and become very, you know, green and lushy, you know, so nice. It's always, you know, things to learn from nature. When I wrote this, I was thinking about, you know, hope and life and how we can um, motivate ourselves. It's called Ka'ahlam al-Nada. Ka'ahlam al-Nada kanat amanina. Ta'anaq nur al-sabah wa tabqasim. La taktarit li sha'a al-shams. Li'annaha sata'ud min jadid. Sata'ud fi al-sabah al-tali. Tarwi qasata ashqam abadiyya. Wa umniyatun tamla al-afaqa. حبا وحياة هكذا كنا نراها لم تكن مجرد أمنيات كانت هي الحياة بالنسبة لنا كانت ألف ليلة وليلة We see in these stories that the issue is not just what we eat, but also the social dimensions of food, sourcing, preparation, cooking, how we eat together and how food connects us to our culture's identity and keeps us strong living away from our traditional homelands. We have a few questions for Imam who joins us today and has been part of the Shep Culture Kitchen from the start. Welcome Imam. Hello. How are you doing today? Good, good, thank you. The first question we have for you, Iman, is you spend a lot of time in the garden growing your food and say that there is always something to learn from nature and you also mention that there is a strong relationship between food and spirituality for you. Can you tell us a bit about that and how that keeps you and your family healthy? Yeah, um, from my own experience is, you know, the nature is the great uh, or the best, you know, teacher for us. Um, I learned a lot. Um, caring is the first. Um, when I do care for my garden and plant, you know, I got reward, you know, with the nice of you and as well as um, I got the uh, the herbs, what I uh, like, I love to use in my cooking. Uh, also, some other veggies, I use it. It's nice to have, you know, in your kitchen door, the herbs you use and uh, in your, um, you know, cooking for your family, which is really great for me to use it always. Um, also, the relationship between um, food and spiritual, it's, you know, it's a great, um, and that's, it's mentioned in our, you know, whole book as well, like the trees and the, the start and the trees, how they, they, they listen and they, they know when we care for them. So that's how I learned from, you know, um, my garden. Also, if you been um, out, you watch the, the trees and the, the insects and the fly, you know, butterflies and all the, you know, other, you know, creature in the garden. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's give you this, you know, you know, um, caring and be patient in, in, in there and yeah. Thank you for sharing, Iman. I, I hear in your comments how important it is for you to grow your own products and be able to um, connect it back to spirituality as well as culture and be able to break that up. And I know when we enjoy food, um, you can feel love um, that goes into 
um, making the dish because it, it's, it's delicious to the taste, but you can also feel where it comes from, which is deeper than just, you know, cutting up herbs. It's rooted in your, uh, your being and it, in the ground in which um, your, you know, is your land that you're, you're living on today. Definitely, when you have your own, you know, things like that, that you use it before in your background or in your uh, childhood time, when you have it there ready and use it, it's definitely bring the, you know, nice moments mm -hmm. and, you know, the time. You feel not just the taste mm -hmm. and you feel the time as well. Yeah, thank yeah. you. We've got one more question for you. Um, early on in the project, you talked about how surprised and shocked you were when you came to Australia for the first time and felt excluded and marginalized because of your faith. We have been a very diverse group working together in this project with women from different culture and faith backgrounds working together. And at times we've had to discuss how we can be inclusive of each other and embrace and allow for each other's differences. Do you have any advice for projects or organizations working with such diverse groups of women about how to make it a positive and culturally safe experience for them? What would your advice be? Yeah, um, nowadays we are, we are actually um, lucky to live in um, diversity, multicultural society. And um, to be, uh, the advice is to be positive and sharing and connecting, interacting with, with the others. And all these things, you know, give us, you know, a sense of being including, you know, with the, with the community. So this is the great things I learned from, since I came to Australia 20 years ago and until now, I didn't give up. I always include myself and didn't feel, you know, <laughs> I'm a difference. So having these positive thoughts, it's, that's what is the important thing to be uh, a part of the community and a part of your, you know, uh, a group as well. Thank you, Imam. It's been a privilege working with you on this project and we look forward to seeing greater things um, and especially enjoying more of your delicious food. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. There are also questions around how we pass on food cultures to the next generation. And it's so critical that this happens now before knowledge is lost. I'd like to introduce Ree Perrick, a 20-year-old artist with roots deep within Fiji, Croatia, and Uganda, an artist living and working on traditional lands of Yorta Yorta people. Born in Australia, she grew up in Uganda before moving back to Shepparton in 2014. Re works across various mediums, including visual art, performance, songwriting, music production, and programming. She is passionate about the work with her community and forming creative expressions through all types of music and art. Before I learned to cook for my grandparents, I was useless. <laughs> I used to burn everything. So my grandparents used to make me do like little jobs here and there where I'd, you know, sometimes go get the grasshoppers and take the wings off or, you know, our um, and send in there, like cooking that, which is deep fried grasshoppers, um, which is a snack over in Uganda. And just also seeing how um, my grandma, which is my judge, she would cook um, outside in a outdoor kitchen. Um, when we would have things like meat, we would actually do the process of killing the animals ourselves and then bringing all the veggies from the villages and everything like that and putting it all together to have like these big family meals. Moving to Shepparton was, kind of like a big turning point because it was the first time that I was um, getting in touch with my um, Pacific Island side. All of a sudden this half of me that was not explored from before was now facing this, I guess, the situation where it's like, who actually am I? Me being half Fiji and I grew up on a base in Brisbane, which had people coming from all over the world to sing and dance through gospel. And then through that, we were able to travel all over the world. So traveling to Asia, to the islands, all around Australia. And then when I was about four years old, that was my first 
actual insight to what it was like living in an African country. So I moved to Uganda and that was me spending all those years growing up there and also going to an international school where people from all over the world had come there. So people with different accents and cultures and it was such a big mix. I was kind of like, wow, like, you know, just United Nations in one place. Food has definitely helped me make connections. Um, a lot of the time when I meet people that are from East Africa, they're quite shocked that I can cook, you know, a lot of the Ugandan dishes. Like even my housemate, for example, I met her because I went to her house and I cooked Ugandan food and she was so shocked. She was like, oh my gosh, like, who's this island girl or like this white girl, like, you know, coming cooking my food. Social media influences what I eat like a thousand percent. But I'm also really invested in like videos that show like the behind the scenes of like how that stuff is made. And so like seeing like the burgers with the hairspray and seeing that like, you know, ice cream is actually like glue, stuff like that. I find it really interesting and it's really important for um, people that are sharing content to make things that are aesthetically pleasing. A lot of the time with the food that's being presented, it shifts us to eat one way. Like, you know, when it comes to things like a home cooked meal that you might see on like an amateur YouTube video where you might be like, actually, that doesn't look good because you're not familiar with it. It's kind of like you're judging that photo before you knowing that they've done all that behind the scenes. <laughs> and when you shame simple things like food, which plays such a big role in our lives, it you start to feel more self-conscious about yourself and, you know, maybe it starts to affect the way that you see things like your hair and your skin colour and um, because if somebody has made fun of one cultural part, cultural aspect of you, then what else are they thinking about that clearly makes you stand out from everybody else? It's all about, yeah, it's all about presentation, I guess. Even I had the same thing um, growing up. It's like, you go to school in your one way at school and you're completely different from the way that you act at home and your parents are kind of like, okay, but you're bringing this facade like back into my house like why are you acting like that you know but it's a responsibility of the people in your community to create those safe spaces for you to be confident in um, your cultures and your foods and everything like that you know my island friends we teach um, my African friends a lot of like the cultural stuff they're like we watch movies together we dance we sing together we do kapa haka together stuff like that and it's really fun to see the way that we all interact because they also um, educate us on things uh, you know back like they were the favor and it's a very it's a very safe space for all of us to come together and kind of eat together but also experience each other's cultures which is really amazing to see Most of the women who have participated in this project are not artists and didn't even particularly consider themselves to be creative prior to the project. An important aspect of the project has been introducing them to the concept of creative process through collaboration over the past year with a professional artist, theatre maker, Jamie Lewis. They have participated in workshops, critical conversations, cultural exchanges and shared meals aimed at developing a series of participatory arts events that will be presented this weekend. Through this process, they have been empowered to become storytellers and influencers. Ree, you are one of these young people we are talking about today, but you've had even more complex upbringing um, between Fiji, Australia and Uganda with a mixed Croatian and Fijian heritage. How has food helped you to navigate your complex lived experience and find identity? I think um, going, uh, starting in Australia, I guess um, I've always had influences of other cultures around me. I grew up with a lot of um, people from diverse backgrounds. So I've always been exposed to a lot of different kind of foods and stuff like that. Um, and then obviously moving over to Uganda, um, what we ate on a regular basis became quite different and everything was sourced um, either naturally or, um, you know, everything was everything was um, not as processed as the things here, but 
Um, you know, that change in um, the things that we eat that I've always been, I've always been proud of what we eat, regardless of where I am. And I'm not, I was never really the kind of person to shy away from, um, you know, bringing food to school. And I know that that was a, a topic that had started a project like this. And I was never really shy of things like that. And I've always been quite proud of sharing those cultural elements. So I think that being able to travel between all the different countries and then settling here, I've always brought on um, that pride, but also willing to um, let others into um to kind of see like what kind of foods we do eat um because that um plays a big part of like our cultures and stuff and i think that um in terms of my identity um i i do consider it you know like what we eat a big part of who we are as well because you know being pacific islander we like to eat um even being in uganda they love to eat and um food is the one thing that connects all of us regardless of where you're from and everyone um everyone has that sense of community when it comes um time to sharing a plate so i think that that's um it's actually one of the biggest um things that draws uh pulls us together and um makes us who we are thanks for sharing now, you also started out a little ahead of other women um, in this project in that you are already a creative of many talents across music, visual arts, design and more. You've also had quite a bit of experience working with different organisations and artists and as a participant in projects. What advice would you give to our listeners today about how to create a safe and self-determined space for women, young people, and diverse communities to engage with programs? I think um, the number one thing is to continue to have these conversations and continue to um, share your knowledge about these things with everyone. Um, don't ever be apologetic for who you are and the things that you do practice. Um, don't be apologetic for where you come from and the things that make up where you come from. So that includes your food, that includes you know your practices, whether it's dancing, singing, your language. Um, be strong in that because that, um, you know, it sets you apart from everyone else and being set apart is good because then it can, you know, coming together um, as a diverse um, group of people, say, for example, this project, we've got um, women from all different backgrounds coming together. It's such a strong project because when we put all our knowledge together, it's so powerful. Um, because we also have insight to, you know, like I don't have the same insight as another woman from this project and they don't have the insight that I have. And I think it's really powerful when you bring those things together. So I think, first of all, having the comments, keeping the conversations alive um, wherever you go, um, whatever opportunity comes up to talk about your heritage, where you come from, be proud and when you talk about it, because it's, um, yeah, a very powerful thing. And I think um, youth, you know, youth watch us and youth watch their parents. So I think um, it starts at home as well. So having those conversations at home, especially, and teaching the children, you know, to, um, it, it all comes down to confidence, teaching your children to be confident in who they are when they go to school and um, t telling them to, you know, preach who they are and everything like that. So, yeah. Love, love the message that you've been able to share with us today. And, you know, if I was to sum up in what a couple of words, I can't say one word because I know I'll say more than one word, um, you know, around the answer to your question for that one is in creating a safe and a self-determined space for women and young people would be to enable them to be who they are. Is Am I right in summarising what you just said? Definitely, 100%. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rue, for your time. And I'm, I've am i enjoyed, again, like everybody else, working with you and tasting your amazing food and look forward to all the great things that you have coming and sharing with us again. Thank you for having me. No worries. Anne Fotu, born and raised on the island of Tonga, Anne migrated to Australia in 2013 for the promise of a better way of living and greater opportunities. Initially settling in Kyabram, her family moved to Shepparton, which is now home, and a place where friends have become family. Anne learned traditional recipes and styles of cooking from her mother, who was a great cook and entertainer. She loves to grill barbecue and bake, with baking being the closest thing to having an underground oven like Bake Home. With a big family of six children and husband, she is continually learning and cooking new things. And since joining the Shepherd and Culture Kitchen, she has discovered a taste of Middle Eastern food. The longer Anne is away from her home country, the more she appreciates her culture and feels proud to be full Tongan. 
Living in Australia, she has been able to give her children a better life, but also tries to teach them their island culture by involving them in cooking and eating traditional foods. Tongans are known for their love and enormous feasts, which play a central role in their culture. Food brings them together as a family, a community. It represents posterity, generosity, and community support. When I had my children in Tonga, they, I realised how they're so not Tongan because they didn't like the food. They were um, surprised with a lot of things. They couldn't speak the language. That was really an eye-opener for me. And so when we came back, I made the decision that um, if I don't pass this on and I don't talk to them about our culture, they will definitely lose it. We're fishermen and seafood is a lot, of, is a big deal. Um, it's a big part of our food. We eat pretty much everything in the ocean. <laughs> I was hoping to get tuna, but they only had salmon. That was fresh. If you know Tongans, we love to eat and we have feasts, massive, massive celebrations and um, that brings everybody together. And growing up with mum and dad, we it didn't matter where you were at the time, we all had to be at home for dinner because everybody had to come together and that's the time where we get to sit down, talk about your day, what, how, you, how was your day. And I remember mum and dad made it a rule that we had to speak English. Dad was the type that would ask, how was your day? And you can't say, good. You have to actually talk about your day. So before dinner time, we'd all be sitting in our rooms preparing what to say in English. <laughs> well, since moving here, yeah. the fish is never fresh for me because I have eaten it straight from the ocean. The longer we are away from home, from Tonga, the more I miss home and the more you realise that you actually have something, your culture is actually very unique. We tell stories in different ways in Tonga. So we do our Tongan dancing, um, we sing a lot. Um, it all tells a story. It's the history of Tongans. Um, it's the story of where they've come from, where they've been. Um, and food is the other one that we tell stories through. So I tell my stories to them. And I know that at the moment they're still young and I was the same. And they probably won't mean anything to them now. But, you know, you get to a certain age like I am now. And I'm so grateful for stories that I hear. And I, you know, relate that to my life, life now. I love to cook and I think that's mum in me now. It's such a good feeling that you cook your own dishes and then I, it makes me so proud to talk about my culture, share with them my food, getting them involved in the kitchen, they're cutting veggies, cutting the meat, helping mum cook and that really takes me back to my memories growing up as well because I used to do the same with my mum. I will always be cooking with mum. So we're cooking the traditional food, we're talking about it, we're telling them where the, you know, the origin of it, um, why we cook it in a certain way. And although they finish cooking and they don't want to eat it because <laughs> it's totally different to what they're used to eating here in Australia. <laughs> And I've always wondered what it'd be like for a professional chef to try one of our recipes and put in their touch. So Vini came to mind because he was the only chef I knew. So Otta is just, you know, raw fish. I think it's probably one of the dishes that hasn't changed much at all because a lot of the Tongan traditional dishes, they have added spices into it now where we didn't have spices growing up. Um, we have coconut milk in almost everything. So it's like if you have a dish, add coconut milk, it's a Tongan dish. <laughs> Back in the islands, you'll be having the real coconut and scraping the coconut and squeezing the cheese out of it. In, in certain ways, like some ways I think, oh, I'm so glad I grew up in Tonga with no Maccas, no KFC. I had no access to any of that, you know, um, fast food. And then I look at my kids and I'm like, you know, I feel sorry for you guys because it's just everywhere like and you can't even tell anymore what's real what's not like <laughs> so I found out through cooking and eating with my kids that they they're not a big fan of the original recipes um, um, and that's why I've definitely started doing looking at other ways of cooking it and finding ways that the kids will eat it too and that they will continue on 
you know, hopefully cook for their families one day too. Give it a mix. Oh, wow. Anne, welcome. Um, today, it's great to have you with us. It's been a pleasure working with you in Shep Culture Kitchen. And I've got a couple of questions for you today, if you don't mind answering them for us, um, so that our listeners out there are able to hear your real life experience in Shep Culture Kitchen Project and, and how it's meant um, to you and, and your family. So the first question, Anne, is, um, can you tell us more about the creative process and how it has empowered you um, and impacted you? Maybe describe a bit about the process you went through with Jamie Lewis and where you see yourself now creatively as compared to the beginning of the project. Oh, thanks, Melissa. Um, the beginning of this program, I honestly never considered myself as an artist. Uh, so when I changed, uh, joined the program, I was a bit nervous at first thinking, oh, I'm actually not creative at all. I am not a dancer. I'm not an artist. Um, I don't sing. <laughs> um, but working with Jamie has actually made me realise um, that being a storyteller is an artist. And that's something that I'm really good at. So, um, and I think it's not, you know, not just me personally, but as a Pacific Islander, um, we tell our stories in so many different ways. So we tell our stories through our dancing, our singing, and we also tell stories through the food that we eat and cook. Um, and so this program has really brought something out out of me that I never knew existed. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to say I am a creative artist. You know, I call myself an artist now. Um, and it's yeah, definitely this program has has done that for me. Um, has helped me learn another side that I never knew existed. Yeah, and you know, you spoke about not feeling like you were an artist at the very beginning, but by golly, those dishes you create are, are, are very, uh, you know, a lot of design goes into it and a lot of effort in ensuring, you know, that the right colours even, um, you know, the right flavours are in there and um, it, it was testimony in seeing you go to work and, and share your your um, beautiful dishes with everyone at the recent um, Converge Festival. So uh, you're, you're right, you're absolutely right in terms of um, storytelling is part of being an artist, um, but also being able to tell those stories through, through food, which you could tell and you could taste literally out at the Converge Festival with your dishes. A second question we have for you, Anne, is Anne, um, a key issue we have been exploring in this project um, has been how we can um, transmit our traditional cultures and values to the next generation growing up here in Australia. How are you managing that with your children? Look, Mel, I'll, I'll take you back to the beginning. So when I first migrated here to Australia, I, you know, growing up in, in Tonga all my life and I come here and I'm like, that's it, I want to be an Aussie, I want to eat their food, you know, go to every cafe, hang where they hang, do what Aussies do. Um, and then, you know, and I loved it and I still do that a lot. But, you know, years, after a lot of years being away from home, you miss home. So I took my kids back to Tonga not too long ago, and I, I was pretty lucky I did that before COVID hit. And when I had the children back home in Tonga, that's when it was a real eye-opener for me because I realised that my kids are not, they're not Tongan. They're, so, they're more Aussie than Tongan. Mm -hmm. They didn't like the food. They didn't speak the language. So when we came back here, I was so determined that it. it's up to me to teach my culture to the kids um, And because if I don't, they'll, they just, they'll lose it. So, yeah, the biggest way for me is, um, you know, I, I love to tell them stories, but they're too young and they just find mum's stories boring. 
So I get them involved in the kitchen and they cook with mum. And as you're cooking these Tongan dishes, they're asking questions. Why are we doing it? Why are we eating this? Why are we cutting that? And that's perfect time for me to explain. This is Tongans love it this way. Tongans has always cooked it this way. And that's that's the best way so far for me to teach them. And, you know, and in the future, I'm hoping that they get to do the same for their kids too one day. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's the biggest eye opener to be able to uh, take them home and, and see literally what it really is like to be, be Tongan or be from wherever culture we, we are from originally. Um, but it's also another big eye opener to see their reactions to what we do within our homes. And you're right, um, it is up to um, ourselves as parents to be able to share our cultures and to teach them. And um, I, I love that you're doing that with your children. I love watching your Facebook um, and seeing how much they're, they're getting into their culture, even learning the language and sharing it with others in the community. So. Big, big props to you, sis, um, for all that you're doing with your kids. And we can only take, um, you know, cues from you and examples so that we um, we also may be able to continue to teach our children within our own homes so that they don't forget where their true roots are from. So thank you for sharing. And again, like everyone else, I have had the greatest pleasure of working with you all on this project. And it's it's great to have you and your insights today on how Ship Project Kitchen has helped you realize um, that you are an artist in your own right um, and that food and culture means a great deal to you and how much it is growing on your children um, who have been raised here in Australia. So thank you for sharing with us today. Oh, thanks, Mel. Thank you. No worries. Yusnesia Yozov immigrated to Australia over seven years ago to work on a dairy farm, choosing to live in Shepparton for the English language support it offered for her young children when they first arrived. She loves Shepparton for its range of op shops and Asian groceries, which she often takes advantage of to find gross ingredients for her home cooking, as well as beautiful fascinators to accessories with. As the eldest child growing up in a small rural village in Malaysia, Yusnesia would always help her mother in the kitchen. From washing up to chopping onions, she learned to cook all of her siblings' favorite dishes, such as nasi ayam, which is chicken rice, and much more. Food is not only central to her life and family, but it is a part of how Yusnesia expresses her colorful, lively personality. Cooking for her and her family, friends, and community is how she shows her love um, for healthy food is made with love to celebrate life. She show gratitude and build relationships. She enjoys the company of those around her, sharing food and stories to foster connections and spread happiness. Yusnesia has a wealth of cooking experience and loves to learn and create new dishes, often inviting friends and cook different types of food for her and discussing recipes with them. Her community-minded attitude drives her to participate in many events and festivals where she volunteers and cooks things like her ever-popular curry puffs. Yusnesia. The first time, uh, I'm not uh, interested, but uh, I try because when I my cook, my mom cook, got the good smile, and uh, and then I tell her, what's my mom cook? What they're doing? This is a time I want to know. I cut the onion. I cry every time. <laughs> I need to help my mom because I have big family. My mom like to cook chicken rice. We call it nasi ayam. Uh, very simple. Have a soup. Have a, a chicken and plain rice. Easy for the kids and also my uh, my sibling to eat together. I always help my mom. I was washing and yeah, because I always in the kitchen with my mom. I have uh, four children, two daughters and two sons. I always uh, ask my family, I ask them, what do you want to cook? Mommy, tomorrow can you make me curry, me curry, uh, Kentucky chicken also? Yes, I'm, I make my family happy, my friend happy, 
and all my community are also happy with my cooking. I'm very enjoy it. <laughs> Favorite thing I would like to cook the spicy, like chicken curry. I like the spicy sauce. Yeah, everything spicy. Yeah. <laughs> when I cook, I give some of my neighbor. I know. From then we start to talk. Yeah, we uh, we know each other. We accept people like um, like friends. Yeah, that's why we can make connection to everyone. Sometimes uh, when we ce celebrate for the Eid Mubarak, and then sometimes for wedding day, yeah, we volunteer to help each other to prepare the um, the dishes. Uh, I always cook. I sometimes I not realize that's my birthday, and then my always my daughter, mommy, uh, where they got some surprise with my my kids and my husband, but cannot surprise because I always in the house. <laughs> uh, sometimes I request for my family. Today I not the one to cooking. <laughs> Maybe you all can cook it for me, or we bought some friends do for us. Maybe I want to taste. Uh, the difference what the people can uh, cooking for me also because they know my birthday maybe they can create the special dish for me yeah <laughs> when I taste uh, I want to know how that you make this and then blah to start to uh, create story to know about the ingredient and then I will try you need balance yeah you have the salt you have sugar, something, you have the coconut cream. You need to combine. Yeah, this means your, your recipe ref, different than other people. Yeah, I try to, uh, to improve. I learn everything from my friends because uh, we have more friends, more idea, uh, more creativity, everything different. Yes, I'm happy because uh, um, because my taste uh, can make people happy. My lovely Dali, my husband, they're very good uh, for flying the roti. <laughs> also, my lovely uh, my daughter, they like my wings. I cannot fly without the wings. Mimi Lang was born in Hong Kong, grew up in England, and now lives in regional Australia. Her work explores identity, belonging, and uses of art to understand and transcend the mundanity of daily life. Her body of work for Submerged is about growing up as a yellow woman and becoming and coming to terms with her lived experiences that have been constantly denied or rejected within predominantly white contexts. A central theme of this work is motherhood and the way her thinking has shifted through seeing her own children move through similar spaces. Mimi Lang. I first came into this project uh, a few years ago and I first met Anita and Jamie um, at the Emerald Bank um, Farmers Market. I just had my second baby, Luna. She's turning three now, so it's been a while. Um, and so we were just talking about what Jamie was doing and the Culture Kitchen project that she was developing with all these incredible women um, in Shepparton. Um, and eventually I came on board and um, was asked to do videos about everyone um, and their, their own food culture and what food means to them and the importance of food in their own lives. Um, and also to develop um, a kind of a, a cookbook, which we'll see a little bit of um, in a minute. Um, so the first meeting we had with 
myself and the woman was at um, Pod Studios and it was a big um, dinner and I was, it was really great to bring my, my daughter Yo-Yo along um, and we, we made a cannelloni, her favourite dish, which she suggested was spinach ricotta cannelloni um, and I was just amazed by all the different kinds of food um, around the table um, and hearing about all the things that everyone has done so far, like even despite um, all the difficulties with COVID, um, it seemed like everyone had formed these like really great friendships already and um, have been involved with sharing recipes and it was a really nice vibe. Um, and I felt a little bit intimidated because I was like, I don't, I'd only just started cooking since um, my kids were born. Like previously, <laughs> it was like not a good, um, yeah, didn't have much knowledge about cooking. So I was just, yeah, very happy to try all these different foods that I would never have um, cooked myself or, yeah. Um, so the creative process for the videos, it, they were really developed in collaboration with the whole team. So I initially, I um, wrote down questions that I wanted to ask everyone about. Um, so um, things that I'd learned about each um, each of the women through our group meetings and some um, individual Zoom sessions that we had. Um, and I was taking notes and writing things that I was curious to learn more about. Uh, like for example, Yusniza, I was just blown away by her like um, positivity and her love of food and how central food is to her and her family. That this is so different to, to myself. So I obviously had lots of questions about how um, how she incorporates food into her life or like how um, how she has developed that relationship with food. Um, or for example, Ri, who's always like so busy doing all these amazing things uh, um, and is very active on social media. So I was curious to ask about uh, how she felt social media um, affects or influences the way we eat. Um, and so kind of just, yeah, this back and forth of like me asking them questions um, and then the woman giving me some feedback and then we'd, um, we locked in some time to do the filming and I just spent a day pretty much with everyone individually um, following them around as they cooked and shopped or like made a meal for their friends and um, just trying to draw out their individual, um, their unique um uh, opinions or viewpoints they have about food and healthy eating um so with each of the videos i really tried to um draw out one thing um about their experience with the food that was specific to them for example on a i was just um really uh inspired by i guess like the way she has um adapted foods um like her traditional Tongan foods so that her kids would eat it and get um, her kids involved in the kitchen and um, to learn more about Tongan culture, which um, I really resonated with me because I am constantly thinking about how I can get my kids to uh, learn more about Chinese culture. I feel like I really connected with all these women in different ways as an artist and as a mother. It's been a, like a huge learning experience for me. Um, just being so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, again, inspired by how everyone is so busy, um, but is also able to incorporate um, cooking every day. And Iman's got this amazing garden um, and, and also doing like um, community work or like studying. It just left me with like no excuses for um, not for, for yeah, not paying more attention to my um, the, my attitude towards food and how I communicate that with my children in a positive way um i guess yeah so if we can just take a look at the book now i can talk about how that's come through um how those experiences have come through here um so yeah i with each of the women we've um i went along to their their homes or some other uh, the kitchen in um kids town and we did some cooking um and so uh, shakila uh, for example we made dumplings together and that just reminded me of how I used to make dumplings with my family on Sundays. Um, and that influenced me to 
you know, then go home and after spending time with Shakila, um, and make dumplings with my kids or, you know, be more insistent on, on like doing cooking together. Um, so in this book, I, it is a cookbook, but I've been trying to incorporate the recipes, um, within the narrative. Um, so instead of like a traditional text-based recipe with maybe, uh, an image in it, I've tried to illustrate the, um, the ingredients and yeah. So it, it kind of flows within the format of a story uh, comic book. Um, so this, so the book is, as well as talking about the woman, um, as well as giving a, a slightly different um, angle on their experiences um, from the videos, it is also a way for me to communicate how I um, experienced the project and the way their, their food and their amazing like generosity and kindness with me showing me that how they do things and you know showing me their skills like this <laughs> this image here of um I was trying to cook I'm um, like trying to make a um rose out of a tomato peel uh which is what Shaquilla showed me um so yeah uh, like how trying to show how um uh, working with these women have um, influenced me and helped me grow my skills uh, as a cook <laughs> as well as um, creatively. Yeah, so the book is going to be probably not um, a traditional straight up text format recipe book. Um, it's going to be a lot more stories and more interesting points about how food can relate not only to physical health, but mental health, social health, um, community well-being um things that maybe we won't we don't think about um particularly often with food straight away um so i think some of the key lessons i've learned about um engaging with communities um uh and trying to encourage a self-determined um framework is just talking with people respecting um respecting other ways of doing things and being um being open to compromise like you know especially with timings like everyone's so busy got lots of different commitments to do and so like setting a date to film was actually really difficult but we did it you know eventually um just by talking and working together um and I found that uh, that yeah like not making assumptions um about each other or even yourself like assuming that you know things or don't know things and just being open to these new conversations um i yeah it's been fantastic working with uh multicultural arts victoria um working with anita who's um had so much experience working with artists like myself and jamie um i felt yeah really supported and the staff at pod melissa arne have been really great and just to see um how the people within organizations interact with community members in a really um like parallel side by side way like like we're all a team and it's not there's no kind of hierarchy um in it uh, i guess i just w yeah want to say thanks to anita um melissa and gb health um for inviting me to be part of this project and thank you to all the amazing women who just like yeah as i said so generous uh, were sharing their knowledge with me and their time and just I uh, had a really good fun just you know following people around the day and seeing how they cook um, and definitely looking forward to doing more next year. Well it's been great being here with you all I hope you have learnt and appreciated the Ship Culture Kitchen project it has been amazing working with these women as you've heard me say multiple times today um, but hands down, it has been a privilege to work amongst eight beautiful women who have such deep roots in their culture and has such a great appreciation for food, not only as they prepare them, but also from whence they come, um, from the ground they grow, even the connection to spirituality and the heavens above um, and, and ground to plate. Um, I know that this isn't the end of Ship Culture Kitchen. And in, if, if anything, so many messages have been shared here today um, in regards to how we can build better and stronger connected communities through food 
as well as culturally safe places that offer culturally appropriate ingredients and foods to our community and how it's okay to be different, um, to eat different and to share difference within our community. We hope that you have taken at least something or one thing away from, from tuning in today to the Ship Culture Kitchen Watch Show. And we hope to see you in the future at um, the upcoming showcasing of these beautiful women's Ship Culture Kitchen, literally their kitchens, um, at starting tomorrow um, or Friday uh with Anne Fotu and her and her team followed by Saturday where you'll be able to enjoy the foods and cultures and these women in person with Yusnisia, Iman and Ri um, at Africa House. If you have any questions or would like to know more about Ship Culture Kitchen feel free to head over to mav.org.au where you'll find the overall background and more about these beautiful women and the project and i hope you tune in for us because we have been funded to go on further for another 12 months with this project so there will be so much more to to share and to learn as we continue on with ship coach kitchen thank you for being with us and we look forward to working with each and every one of you in the future and bringing our community better connected um, and greater, stronger together through food and culture. Thank you. I'm